Well, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we've had a, a technical problem. There was no microphone, but I've got a loud voice. But those at the back, if you can't hear me, just go like that. <laughs> so can you hear me at the back? No problem. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so today, the theme will be about the lotus. And as I said last week, the lotus was about to bloom in the palm gardens. And I went there yesterday, and it has bloomed. <laughs> and I can recommend it. It's an absolutely beautiful flower. Right. In my first lecture, we saw that the enduring legacy of Jensen and Frobenius was to argue that food not only fills the belly, it also provides food for religious thought. They identified two mythic themes of great generality based upon two food crops, namely tubers and cereals, and showed how they were the basis of two moral codes founded on murder and theft. And Jensen's primary concern was to understand sacrifice rituals, which led him to focus on the, on the analysis of myth and rituals in root crop cultivators. And I showed that the school of cultural morphology that Frobenius founded owes much to the botanical studies of Goethe who coined the word morphology, and if you look at the English dictionary, you'll find a reference there to Goethe. And he argued that the creative imagination of people must be grounded in the unity of poetry and science. Now, my work since 1982 has been with the study of the economy and culture of rice cultivators, and in particular, with the performance of a woman's oral epic called Lakshmi Jaga that is sung and ritually enacted out in a two-week ritual at harvest time around October, November. I showed that this oral tradition, which is sung by the Halbi-speaking women of the Busta Plateau in central India, is an, uh, a variation on the all-Indian myth about Lakshmi. Uh, which in turn is a variation on the general Indo-European myth about the theft of grain that Jensen and Frobenius identified. <clears throat> but I suggested that if we are to understand this Halby myth, it is necessary to move from the general to the particular and to look at different types of cereals. And I suggested from the myth we need to distinguish between rice and millet and other grains based upon uh, dry grains and the cultivation of aquatic crops like rice. And I suggested too that rice is the most productive of all grasses domesticated by Homo sapiens. The yield ratio of seeds planted to grains harvested is about 10 times that of wheat which is one of the reasons that the population of monsoon Asia is 10 times that of Europe. So it comes as no surprise then to find that the rice cultivators of Busta identified wealth and happiness with rice and poverty and misery with millets and other dry grains which you eat when the rains don't come. Lakshmi is identified with rice and wealth and her sister, a Lakshmi, non-Lakshmi, with millets and poverty. And people worship Lakshmi so that she may reside in their houses and bring them good fortune in the form of wealth. But as I said, Lakshmi is a fickle goddess and she leaves the house if there is discord and vice. And when that happens, her place is taken by a Lakshmi the goddess of misfortune, who brings poverty and misery. Now, what interests me is the values that inform the mythical thought and ritual actions concerning Lakshmi. And we find that they are a complex interplay of religious values, familial values, and economic values, which means that the concept of wealth that Lakshmi symbolizes is not just material wealth, 
in the form of money and commodities, as the economists uh, want to restrict the notion of wealth to, but also human wealth in the form of sons and daughters, material wealth in the form of food, clothing, shelter, gold, money, etc., but also social wealth in the form of friendships and fame and status and good life and a long life. Now these myths uh, about Lakshmi have inspired the imaginative work of poets, artists, sculptors and musicians and they express these values through key symbols such as water, the lotus, rice, the elephant and so on. And I suggested that the story of uh, children as wealth is a story of the lotus. The story of material wealth is the story of rice and the story of fame and friendship uh, as wealth is a story of the bride. So today I want to focus on the symbolism of the lotus because this is the primordial symbol of Lakshmi and as such the primordial symbol of wealth. Water, as we shall see, is not a symbol of her, but a precondition of her existence. Water, or rather monsoon rain, is personified by the goddess Mengen, which means cloud. That is Lakshmi's mother. So water is the mother of Lakshmi, and she's also identified with Irrawati, the elephant. Now the lotus, like rice, is an aquatic crop that needs water to grow in. It is also the native plant of India and India's national flower. It is an extraordinarily beautiful flower that emerges unstained, and this is the critical point, it emerges unstained from dirty, filthy, muddy waters. <laughs> and, uh, but unlike rice, it is not a staple food, even though parts of it can be eaten as a delicacy. And if you want to try it, I suggest the Chinese uh, restaurant opposite Hofbahnhof, <laughs> and you can get all sorts of lovely lotus there. That little restaurant downstairs, beautiful. <clears throat> now, as such, the primary function of the lotus has been to provide food for religious thought, not so much food for the belly. And this leads me to the question I want to consider today, why is the lotus the primordial symbol of Lakshmi, and as such, the primordial symbol of wealth in India. Now this question has a simple answer and a complicated answer. <laughs> Let me start with the simple answer. The simple answer is that children are one of the most important forms of wealth in India, and the birth of children is likened to the flowering of a lotus. And many religious traditions are based on myths of miraculous birth. In this sense, Hinduism is no exception. But what ex distinguishes Hinduism from, say, Christianity is that the gods and goddesses have their miracul miraculous birth from a lotus. That is to say, the gods and goddesses are lotus-born. Now, the complicated answer as to why Lakshmi is a primordial symbol is that different people in different times and different places over thousands of years and all over Asia have imagined the symbolism to be different. As such, a vast and extremely com uh, complicated theology of the symbolism of the lotus has arisen over 2,000 years and has provided food for thought for priests and priestesses and practitioners, firstly in Vedic India three, 4,000 years ago, and then to other countries in Asia where its symbolism has been taken up and developed. Now, I consider this other literature briefly in order to set the scene for my main concern, which is the poetic imagination of the Guru Mais of the Basta district. And, and what concerns me is how they use the symbolism of the lotus to think about wealth and happiness. And I think it's important to recall that the Guru Mais of Buster are poor, low caste, illiterate, Halby speaking women who are mothers and grandmothers and who spend years, months every year watching rice grow. 
So they are experts on the morphology of the rice plant. Needless to say, this point of view has shaped their values, their imagination and their sacred poetry. And as I said last week, quoting Maus, values have valuers and we must locate the valuers geographically, historically and ethnographically. And as Maus said, there's a difference between the culture of the kings and the culture of the people the myths and values of women and the myths and values of men and the myths and values of the old versus the young. <clears throat> now, when the, the Lakshmi Jaga epic has 38 chapters, the first two chapters appeal, invoke the goddesses, tell them to wake up and invite them to attend the epic which the Lakshmi Guru Mahas are about to sing. Now, like most sacred, the third chapter begins at the very beginning. That is to say, with the birth of the gods and goddesses and the creation of the world. And this extremely important chapter in the epic takes just 323 lines out of 31,000. But it can be summed up, as we'll see very briefly, with the aid of some sketches my collaborator, his brother, is an artist, and when the epic is performed, he is called upon to decorate the houses with these symbols of what going, what's going on. And we've commissioned him to prepare illustrations of the 38 chapters of the epic. And here is his uh, illustration of the first chapter, which doesn't make any sense. We'll now pull it apart for you. So we can, by doing this, we can really summarise this first chapter in three episodes. Episode one. The first segment depicts the birth of the, supreme, the three supreme gods of the Hindu pantheon from the primordial lotus that emerges from the primordial sea. Vishnu is the firstborn and the only one born directly from a lotus. Brahma and Shiva um, are born they're born next from Vishnu's pubic area. But what happens? The waters of the primordial ocean wash them away, but they are saved by Basut Nag, the serpent god. Episode 2. The gods, having been successfully created in the first segment, and the other two segments tell of how the gods go about creating the three worlds, the upper world, the middle world, and the, un the underworld. When they try to create earth using the excrement of an earthworm, a demon thwarts their attempts. <clears throat> they then the three brothers, as they're known in this epic, and we'll see later on, the idiom of local kinship is very crucial in understanding the story. They call upon Kalik Mata to destroy the demon, which of course she does, <clears throat> and this enables the brothers to create the three worlds and to populate them with all the deities that will appear in the epic. <clears throat> now this summary account does considerable violence to the poetry and music of the epic and to the emotions and sensual pleasures excited by the performance. And it suffices to note that the poetic beauty of the epic, like all oral poetry, found everywhere, from the Bible to Eastern Indonesia to Russia, anywhere you go, founded on the, the principle of the parallel lines, where one line either repeats itself or does a complete inversion or does some other um, synthesis of the lines that become before it. And so this is sung in terms of four basic melodies, and it's very hypnotic and uh, very relaxing to listen to. Now, the origin myth here is a variation on the widespread Hindu myth about the miraculous birth of gods from a lotus. What sets it apart from other accounts is that it is sung by women. This, of course, is critical. And when we focus on the relationship between values and valuers, uh, uh, 
we'll see that the, uh, the story they tell from the point of view of women is an elaborate allegory, an elaborate extended metaphor of the childbirth process from a mother's point of view. Now, like all good allegories, it has many different overtones of meaning that enable listeners to quite literally contemplate the meaning of their life and the pursuit of happiness. But to understand the specificity of this account, we must begin uh, with the idea of the lotus as the primordial symbol and inquire into its, um, uh, its meanings. Now, the story does not explicitly establish the identity of the lotus with Lakshmi, but the comparative evidence is overwhelming. Scholarly opinion is in agreement on this point because the worshippers agree. The lotus is not only the primordial symbol of, uh, of Lakshmi, it's also her primordial essence, her divine essence, as Rhodes said in her recent analysis of the Sanskrit myths about her. Uh, her divine essence, she says, is understood to dwell in that form and worshippers see the lotus not only as a symbol but an actual embodiment of the, the goddess. In other words, the relationship between the lotus and Lakshmi is not only based on likeness but also on absolute identity. Lakshmi is the lotus. The lotus is Lakshmi which gets us back to the question posed above. Why is the lotus taken as the supreme symbol and form of wealth and good fortune? How are we to understand this equation? Now, Jensen reminds us that to understand means to uncover the initial, initiating creative forces. Now, the sacred Indian lotus has long captured the religious imagination of people in Asia. And the special characteristics of this plant must be our starting point. And we saw in our last lecture that Goethe's quest for the primordial plant was unsuccessful. But there is a sense in which the Hindus, by contrast, have been successful. <laughs> the lotus is the primordial plant. And the, the German word is what? Uh, how do you pronounce it? Ur, 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 Ur thank you. <laughs> now, I'm quoting here from Rhodes. To contemplate the serene and easeful characteristics of this aquatic plant, she says, is to be invited into an almost surrealistic realm of symbol. The lotus is considered to evoke the full range of existence of its elemental variegations with its roots deeply embedded in the muddy soil of the pond bed, its stalk holding steadfastly through the waters, and its flower rising glorious in the air, untouched by other elements. Some varieties of lotus may take two or three years to bloom, which may then unfurl slowly and steadily over the course of three days, finally revealing the fullness of its exquisite flower, complete with its intoxicating fragrance. It's a beautiful uh, perfume. It then takes another three days to fall back upon itself, perpetuating its cycle of incubation, unfolding, opening in full majesty, and then closing inward again. <clears throat> the luxuriant fertility of the waterborne lotus as it moves through these cycles replicates the process of the goddess as one who gives birth to the world, nourishes it, and oversees it in its eventual dissolution. As well, the lotus in full bloom is seen as an expression of abundance, of beauty, of purity, of gracefulness, of mystery, and the revelation of the goddess. Now, as I said, all parts of the lotus can be eaten, but it has never been a staple. And its primary use value has been to provide food for imaginative thought. Its most significant quality from a religious point of view, as I said before, it emerges unstained and beautiful from dirty, muddy water. And it comes as no surprise that sacred poets liken the life cycle to that of the human life cycle. Like the lotus, 
The newborn baby emerges unstained and beautiful from the bloody, watery, excremental mess that accompanies birth. The human imagination everywhere links the spheres of plant reproduction and human item reproduction with the idea of purity and pollution conceived of as religious values. These values inf inform the first ritual that people as babies of different uh, cultures belong to. The rituals in Buster are held over a week or so uh, and end with the mother's temporary pollution period. Interestingly, in Buster too, the birth of a child is also the symbolic rebirth of their grandparents. So we have, yeah, for those kinship wallers, we have alternate generations. <laughs> so they believe that grandparents are reborn as grandchildren, and when a child is born, they check it out for marks. And, ah, that's so and so, you know. <laughs> so they can, uh, it's a very strong belief that people are reborn uh, every second generation. The captivating power of the lotus on the religious imagination extends beyond the distinction between purity and pollution, of course. It has inspired the work of mythologists, sculptors, artists for thousands of years, and that in ways that have become ever more complicated throughout the ages. I mentioned briefly a scholarly work by Zimmer, a wonderful German scholar, who looked at it traces the Indian symbols, the cultural history of the symbolism of the lotus in art and sculpture from pre-Vedic times to the present. He also traces the metamorphosis of the lotus uh, as it's incorporated into Buddhism, Jainism and other religions and then ideologically transplanted to Burma, China, Japan and Tibet. Absolutely wonderful scholarly treatment. Zimmer's work illustrates how a symbol acquires secondary and tertiary levels of significance as it grows and develops and spreads over historical time and geographical place. As a native plant to India, not found in Tibet, Zimmer finds its primary origins in India where he notes, quite correctly in my point of view, that it is a, ve a vegetable symbol of the goddess Lakshmi, the patroness of rice growing agriculture. This is why I quote him, of course. He also discusses the Sanskrit myth that accounts for Lakshmi's association with elephants. Elephants, he notes, are clouds sent, sentenced to walk on the earth. They are termed the king's clouds, and they guaranteed rain for his people in a period of monsoon. In other words, water then is a common theme that renders Lakshmi, the lotus, and rice all as members of the same family. The secondary and tertiary symbolism of the lotus is developed in later Hindu and Buddhist thought where the goddess of wealth and happiness becomes, quote, the highest rep representative of world transcending wakefulness, very abstract theological terms. In art, we see the lotus surviving as a pedestal for the numerous divine um, figures and they normally have a lotus in their hand. Now, in the 50 years since Zimmer wrote his classic study, Hinduism has become a global religion. The symbolism of the lotus is now the basis of an esoteric theology that informs the global yoga industry. And in the uh, Kundalini yoga tradition, for example, the body is a lotus flower, and the seven stages that inform the passage from root to flower are the seven chakras on one's journey to enlightenment. Each stage is very rich in symbolic associations. The root chakra is called Muldalaradhara and is associated with the genital region of a male and female and is represented by a lotus with four petals and with the bone as the physical sign. This is a sign of the dormant potential force known as Kundalini. The top or seventh chakra is represented by a lotus with 1,000 petals with semen, male semen, as the, as the physical form. And breathing then is likening to the opening and closing of the, uh, of the flower. Meditation awakens the kundanali, the awakening of my kundanali, Swami Saraswati, the author of Kundalini Tantra said, was like the climax of a male, a man's desire. It's interesting to note that the Swami also uses the language of morphology to, to describe the process of wakening. 
When a total awakening occurs, he says, a metamorphosis takes place. A man becomes a junior god, an embodiment of divinity. For the practitioners of Kundalini Tantra, then, the lotus is the primordial plant of the kind that uh, Goethe searched for. And given Goethe is interested in um, alchemy and mythical uh, uh, spiritual thought, one imagines you'd be happy to read about this 21st century development of his ideas, as he would be to see that's also the basis of modern plant um, uh, biology. But there's a problem here. When we look at the, um, the sacred plant, we see we start with a seed and end with a seed. And so, in other words, is that an egg or a seed? <laughs> Should we take a male point of view or a female point of view? And, um, and modern women, for their part, are troubled by this seminal idea of the seed. <laughs> and that informs male images of this primordial plant. <clears throat> and um, as I said, in Swami's imagination, the male seed, semen, is, gives us the etymology of the word seminal. And so we speak of seminal ideas rather than of unknown ideas, i.e., <laughs> make that word up, ideas that are based upon egg thought. And, and what we find is that um, a lot of female practitioners of yoga, and one of my friends in Australia, she's been into tantric yoga since childhood, she says, in discussions with women, um, the, uh, confronting these discussions, some women yogis have pointed out that this leaves women entirely out of the picture because they do not produce semen. And uh, she says that they, they are now reworking the ideology to talk about uh, production of procreative fluids and are dismissing this older discourse. Which is not to say, which is to say again, to get back to Mouse's point, is these are neither right nor wrong, but rather there are male point of view and female point of view that we should take account of. I should say too, it's not only Western women converts to Hinduism who are questioning the seminal ideas of received religious practice. A documentary film recently about family planning in India contains a wonderful sequence where a group of women are sitting around discussing their different perspectives on motherhood. <clears throat> One had the following to say about the negative valuation men place on menstrual blood. I quote, I feel that once a woman starts to menstruate, she acquires a strange kind of power, the power of giving birth, of creating new life. Men do not possess this kind of power. Only women have it. So men are afraid we might rise above them because of this power. To control it, they invented menstrual taboos. Don't touch the food. Don't go near the shrine. Don't enter the kitchen. Men impose these restrictions on us. They impose these restrictions on us to control our power and to use it for their own benefit. Uh, these are illiterate women, I should say. Illiterate women, that's it. While I have not come across such articulate formulations of antagonistic points of view in the course of my field work on the sacred poetries of the Guru Mais, the songs they sing express sentiments that affirm a positive valuation of those bodily substances deemed polluting by conventional discourse. In other words, they don't deny the negative male valuations about menstrual blood, but simply ignore them and articulate alternative positive values that link menstrual blood with the creation of new life. For example, in a discussion I had with Guru Mai Sukdai about these matters last December, she told me the following story of how the goddess was reincarnated as the goddess Sita. Every month for nine months, Lakshmi, I'm quoting now, every month for nine months, Lakshmi would collect her menstrual blood in a clay pot buried in a field. In the tenth month, a servant of King Janak was ploughing the field when he came across the pot. He took it to the king, who found on opening it 
that it contained a child whom he raised as his own daughter. He named her Sita, Sanskrit for pharaoh, because she was found in a field. Now this is a variation on the well-known birth uh, myth about the birth of Sita, but that the idea that her design essence is congealed menstrual blood is nowhere to be found in the popular ethics. And so, as I said last year when I was there with my daughter, she, uh, she was interested to know what happens to the menstrual blood when you're pregnant. <laughs> and so for her, that nine months of menstrual blood is the essence of life. <clears throat> so, um, so the male perspective is a valid one, but only part of the story. And it also raises the question of value and the, and the question of the social status of the valuer. Now, ethnographic evidence of this kind leads me to question a fundamental assumption of American interpretivist approach to the analysis of symbols. For them, in the classic theory of Geertz, culture is a search for meaning conceived of as shared values. Now, while the dominant values are shared by many, the fact remains that contrary values, contrary valuers have contrary values. Disagreement is much a fact of life as agreement and an approach to culture that ignores agreement or disagreement denies the existence of what some people hold be the, the, the very source of creativity and hope for the human condition. Whatever way one looks at it, as soon as one raises the question of is menstrual blood pure or impure, the question of value arises. But now the new question is, how do we uncover the values of a symbol and that hold for our values? <clears throat> Um, it is useful to bear in mind that the cultural product we are dealing here then is myth in the form of sacred poetry and that poetry is all about symbols. As such, it is best to go back to first principles and ask the question of what is a symbol? Such is the approach that uh, Bogie takes in his poetry workshop and I will uh, read a, a key passage. The word symbol is related to the Greek word symbolon, which was a half coin carried away by each of the two parties as an agreement, uh, as an agreement, as a pledge of their good faith. A symbol, therefore, is like half a coin. It is an object. The other half of the coin is the idea it represents. When a person understands a symbol, the two parts come together and the meaning is passed on. When the symbol is not recognised, it remains no more than a simple object. What Bogie did not make explicit is that when the material parts come together, the meaning that is passed on assumes a form of a value, a form of human reciprocal recognition that takes us from the realm of material objects to the world of a human imagination. Now, we can illustrate this well by uh, some symbols one can buy on the internet. <laughs> Certain necklaces one can buy on these days, online these days, provide us with a classic example of the notion of value that is at stake. A necklace is a material object on a chain that consists of an irregular symbol with the name Lisa written on it. To understand the value of this object, we need to ask two questions. What is the missing half? When the two parts come together, what value does it symbolise? Voila, the missing half. <laughs> <clears throat> when we investigate these questions, we find that the missing part is another necklace with the name Daniel on it, worn by a woman named, guess who, Lisa. Putting these two together, we find that the value expressed is an effective run, an emotional value, one of love. And um, so in other words, the, uh, the notion of effective value then is a metamorphosis of the money form of a value. And the original Greek context, the coins were cut up and used in a non-monetary way to create new forms of value. 
It should be noted too that Daniel and Lisa here were involved in a transaction that, formally speaking, was like a market transaction. Daniel gave Lisa a necklace with his name on it, Lisa re reciprocated with one of her name on it. And of course, but to in interpret this as a market transaction would be to completely misunderstand the, the values at stake. Needless to say, the history of gift exchange is a history of misunderstandings of these kinds. <clears throat> Effective values then are emotion, moral sentiments, not exchange values in the political economist sense. This analysis, let me get a glass of water, not quite so hot today. This particular case enables us to develop a general framework for the analysis of value. If an object is a symbol, it will have a missing physical part, and the task of value analysis is to identify the missing part and to grasp the imaginative leap that unites them together in the minds of the valuer. Unlike monetary value, which is a divisible symbol expressed in quantitative terms, quantitative ratios, effective value like love and other emotions are additive and they refer to a holistic relationship that binds the people together as values, people, objects and things. We are now in the position to formulate the question of the value that the Lotus poses. <clears throat> in this case, the problem is a little bit upside down because we know that Lakshmi's value as a symbol, we know what her value stands for before we start. She is the goddess of good fortune. Good fortune, as the dictionary reminds us, is an auspicious state resulting from favorable outcomes. An auspicious state for its part is one that shows or suggests that future success is likely. In other words, it's a forward-looking value. It, uh, a good sign of things to come, and I'm very grateful for my neighbours on the basement for giving me the, the German translation. <laughs> um, now, when we think of a lotus as a primordial symbol of Lakshmi, the reference is not to an inert thing, but to a, a living object that arises and passes away and is reborn. In other words, to the life cycle of a plant, to its reproduction process. The auspicious state is one that augurs well for the future. And the reproduction of the plant, uh, the, uh, the stage when new life emerges from an old. We must focus then on the metamorphosis of the plant from seedling, from seed to seedling, from seedling to mature plant, from mature plant to flower, from flower to new seed. Now, the lotus is unusual that it can be reproduced either sexually or asexually from cuttings. And the question that arises then is what likeness to a human reproductive process does the lotus excite in the imagination of a mother or we might say a midwife? And what's the word in heb hebami, is it? <laughs> hebami. And the, uh, here is the answer. For them, the answer is obvious. The newborn baby girl whose navel is yet to be cut, and I stress the fact the navel is yet to be cut, is the key issue. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I confess it was not obvious to me, but it was only after a long discussion with my midwife daughter and after a long discussion with Guru Mai and other people that I began to see the likeness between the newborn baby, the newborn baby with the... Uh, placenta still attached to an uprooted lotus. Uh, I wasn't able to test this out and take a photo at the palm garden, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, doubtless at the end of the season you might be able to do that. Now childbirth is a process that most men know very little about, and it is an ethnographic topic on which men can only collect hearsay evidence. I was fortunate to witness the birth of my daughters, which gave me some first-hand experience of what it means from a father's point of view. But I know of no fathers in Buster who have ever seen the birth of their children. 
Um, even in Euro-American culture, the presence of fathers at birth is a relatively recent thing. Men of my father's generation, for example, were not so privileged. But I have found that educated men in India, those with university degrees, are so ignorant of the birth process that they don't know how ignorant they are. <laughs> <laughs> when I was translating with my male collaborators, there's the whole epic it has a whole section on menstruation and a whole section on birth and goes through all the details and all the languages there, but it's in poetry and they talk about flowers and, and so it became clear that my colleague had no idea what a placenta was this, <laughs> and, and, had, and of course had no idea what the pull, the flower, the poetic version of that was as me. And, and so the, um, the word full means flower and is one of the metaphors Halby speaking women use to describe the birth process. <clears throat> and uh, I also got Guru Mai's daughter to give me an account of the birth process and she also did this diagram for me, which we show, importantly, the child still separated to the mother. And I think this is the, the crucial relationship that they see in this first pregnancy stage. This is a sketch she drew to illustrate her descriptive account of the actual birth process she experienced four times of the mother. Another image they use is Chahandi, or four water pots, which of course describes the flow of the amniotic fluid, what we call the, the breakings of the water in English. I think you have a similar word in, in German. And um, <clears throat> now, so what distinguishes the Indian images is that the lotus is their national plant. And when one becomes familiar with the biology of childbirth, the botany of the lotus plant, and the language used to describe the childbirth processes, it is not hard to see where these matters come from. Obvious, too, is that these creation myths of the sacred woman are allegories of the birth process. We always have floods <laughs> in, in uh, origin myths. This is the, the four waters. <laughs> and uh, so you can just go on and on. It's just... Once you see the, the allegory, it's quite simple. Now, my understanding of the symbolism of the latest was further enhanced last year when my daughter and I, as I said, accompanied me uh, to Buster and we had a discussion with Guru Mai. And I should add that um, my, my understanding of the birth processes was restricted to hospital-based birth, birth processes that have arisen in Europe in the 17th century when men started intervening in the birth processes as high status gynaecologists replacing the low status males, females. This brought health benefits in terms of declining infant and maternal mortality, but at a ritual cost in places activity like India where hospital births is becoming more, uh, more popular. What I was interested in is finding out was the traditional midwifery practices in non-hospital births. Now, needless to say, by this time I devoured much of the literature and was able, with my daughter's help, to formulate a number of relevant questions. I was able to confirm that traditional childbirth practices in India are a minor, in Buster, are minor variations on those practiced in India and indeed many other parts of the world in that the navel cord is not cut until after the placenta is delivered. This is a, a really key, key factor of many childbirth processes the world over. The midwife leaves the newborn baby on the floor while she concentrates on delivering the placenta. This practice contrasts sharply with hospital practices that have developed in the West where the navel cord is clamped and cut immediately, immediately on delivery of the newborn. <clears throat> so there's some terms, we'll come back to some of those terms. Um, now, mothers in the West have also begun to question their biological, psychological and spiritual wisdom of cutting the umbilical cord, the navel cord, straight away. And the, if you look at the word lotus birth in an English dictionary, we'll find there are now two meanings. <laughs> the first meaning, as I said there, A, chiefly in Hinduism, the miraculous birth from inside a lotus. 
The second is the practice of not cutting the navel cord immediately after delivery, but allowing it to fall off naturally. So the term latest birth in this second sense was coined by an American clairvoyant nurse and teacher called Claire Latest Day, who, when pregnant, questioned doctors about the need to cut the navel cord immediately upon delivery of the child. In 1974, she gave birth to a son called Trimurti, whose navel cord was allowed to wither away and fall off naturally, a process that took about 10 days. As the names of mother and child would suggest, Claire Lotus Day is an American Hindu, and Hinduism, like Christianity, has now become a global religion. But whereas Christianity has been eagerly embraced by people in the former colonised worlds, uh, Hinduism has been taken up by the people such as uh, Claire Davis, Claire Day and others in the US during the, um, during the 60s. As might be expected for someone like Claire Lotus Day, she emphasises the spiritual aspect of the birth, stressing the need for, quote, keeping the unity of pregnancy of mother and child, and indeed the same as the women in Boston. She states that she got the idea from Jane Goodall's book about chimpanzees in the shadow of man, rather from Hindu religious texts. Chimps and humans, it seems, are unique in that we, generally speaking, do not eat the placenta. Most other animals eat the placenta. And um, chimps, unlike us, keep the placenta intact until it comes away naturally. <clears throat> now, the lotus birth movement is not just a spiritual movement because it raises the question of the biological and psychological nature that medical practitioners are now starting to debate. That is to say, when should the cord be cut? Should it be done immediately or should it be left for some time? As it is the standard hospital practice in the world, in the West. Now, important biological and psychological issues of a scientific kind are at stake here. The placenta is a vital living organ composed of, the, of as the same cells as the baby. Birth is a significant transition in fetal circulation. When the, baby in the womb, when the baby is in the womb, it obtains oxygen from the mother via the placenta, but gets oxygen via its own lungs when born. But the blood still flows through the navel cord until it is cut. Here is the central issue. Is immediate clamping and cutting of the cord good or bad for the baby's health? Modern hospital practice, which practices immediate surgical severance, um, uh, and the lotus birth movement, which advocates delayed, represent two extreme positions, both of which have a cultural history, <laughs> and uh, both of which are, of course, uh, so we shouldn't think that the medical, medical practice has a medical history. In fact, uh, Inch, in her review of this debate, makes the following observation. The first step in the slippery slope of the third stage of intervention seems to have taken place in the 17th century in Europe, coincidentally as more and more men entered the field of midwifery, and, became, and it became the custom to cut the cord before the placenta was delivered, presumably to remove the baby. This action deprives the baby of the blood that remains in the placenta, but it does not affect the mechanism of uh, placental separation. This, however, makes a mess. And it was about this time that it became normal practice to deliver a woman in bed instead of using birth stools, and the linen was soiled. So cord clamping was introduced prior to cord cutting for no better reason than to spare the bed linen. <laughs> in other words, for, not for cultural reasons. It suffices to note that the World Health, World Health Organization has reviewed this debate and now officially endorses delayed cord, cord clamping because it is a shame that the immediate cord clamping can be detrimental to the health of the infant. But the recommended delay is now only a few minutes and it is still done before the delivery of the placenta. Now it comes as no surprise that Claire Lotus Day found her inspiration in the work of Jane Goodall rather than the classic Sanskrit texts because they were um, 
they were written by urban male scholars for whom birth was seen of as, as a polluting process and women as midwives regarded as untouchable of the untouchables. Now, to get some idea of what's going on here, we have to search long and hard uh, through the uh, ethnographic evidence to see what's going on. Very Elwin, it's very... Uh, uh, a well-known mid-20th century ethnographer of the tribes of central India, wrote an interesting article on birth rituals. He was told, for example, quote, that the placenta is the flower which has fruit, uh, uh, which is the child. What gives his account some veracity is one of his informants was his, uh, his wife, who was a gone woman. This is also consistent with one of my findings, and it is clear that birth rituals the placenta is given a sacred value and it must be ritually disposed of after birth. So it's practiced the key ritual of the birth. There's many rituals at birth, but the disposal of the placenta is the key ritual. And here Vlaul in his account of birth among the Padans reports that a special fire is lit above the spot where the cord and placenta are buried. On the sixth day after birth, he adds, another ceremony is celebrated this is mainly intended for women, for the mother and the midwife and immediate neighbours, where liquor and some food. The fire is now extinguished and the bits of wood unconsumed are thrown away. This act marks the symbolic end of the placenta as a vital organ. It is a death ritual. That death ritual, the death of the placenta is the birth, the, the death of the, uh, of the flower is the birth of the food. And so classic Hindu dialectics, <laughs> birth is death, death is birth. But the death of the flower is the birth of the fruit, the newborn baby, whose severance from the flower is marked by different rituals, the most important of which is a naming ceremony when relatives and friends gather about a week after the birth to bless the child and pray for its long life. Further evidence that the birth ritual is conceived of as a severance ritual come from Peter Berger's account, uh, from the Gadaba, just across the road from me uh, on the Buster Plateau. His analysis, he had a wife <laughs> who did some excellent work. She attended many birth rituals and, importantly, she paid close attention to the language that people, the women, use during the birth process. And, again, she found that the afterbirth and the child are referred to as a flower until the child is given a name. In other words, the fruit is severed from the flower and given an, a name in one ceremony, while the flower is buried in another ceremony. So, that in fact, the burying is a, a process of cremation and burial of the, of the placenta. The Gadaba ritual of the disposal of the placenta differs slightly from that of the Padan. The father digs a hole near the house, and when he has left, the midwife brings the afterbirth to the site and together with the mother sits beside the pole as an overbirth, the afterbirth is covered with soil and offerings as, as made. A stone is placed on top and the mother washes herself with turmeric. And I stress that in turmeric because that's a, a sign of auspiciousness, a very important uh, substance in Indian rituals. And so it's an anointing. So you have a, an anointing and a severance and a creation of a new unity. So this marks the end of the midwife role and a different uh, ritual specialist comes in. So in other words, the midwife is perhaps the most important priestess in the whole process of a life cycle ritual. So as I said, the traditional Indian midwife has both a medical role in the delivery of a baby and a religious role in the disposal of the afterbirth. Now in order to understand the significance of the midwife's role it is necessary to review the natural history of mammalian childbirth and the, the, the rise of the midwife. Because only when we do this can we understand the sacred poetry and ritual of human childbirth. Now, this slide shows, as we saw later, the, these lotus birth people appeal to nature. <laughs> and their understanding of nature is problematic, and they say, well, the, you know, the monkeys do it this way and they eat the child of earth. But it's interesting to find out what the monkeys really do do. This slide shows the three stages of labour for a monkey. In the first stage, the fetus becomes engaged in the birth canal. The second is the delivery of the newborn 
and the third is the delivery of the placenta. This is relatively fast for a monkey compared to a human, but the key difference is that the baby emerges facing in the same direction as the mother. This enables the mother to reach down and guide the baby out as it emerges from the birth canal. And note too that the infant uses its own hands. What happens? Bipedalism has totally changed the process of birth for, for humans. It has changed the shape of the birth canal and the baby emerges facing away from rather than towards the mother. And so in other words, this means that a normal delivery, the mother cannot assist the baby without damaging it. And so she needs the assistance of another person. And Trevelyan argues that this is the origin of the midwife. And uh, an argument, interestingly, that calls into question uh, Levi Strauss's argument that the incest taboo is the bridge between nature and culture. So she's arguing really is the midwife <laughs> is the bridge between nature and culture. And, um, <clears throat> and um, the problem with that, of course, though, is not all human cultures have midwives and sometimes monkeys have helpers. <laughs> But the, the exceptions establish a generality uh, about bipedalism and midwives because of the undeniable, deniable fact that most human cultures have midwives and that no chimps that now I have now of have specialist midwives. One study of 296 cultures found that only 24 report the absence of midwives. In other words, 92% have specialist midwives, 8% didn't. Now, the Lotus Birth Advocates then say we must distinguish not three stages of labour, but four and for the human. And as I say, they make that important uh, fact is that the birth canal twists and the baby emerges facing at a bit of an angle, as all the mothers here. Sometimes it faces the wrong way, sometimes it comes a breach, <laughs> but in general it faces uh, more or less at an angle and backwards. So the first stage is, uh, is when the cervix dilates and the fetus begins to start its downward descent. The second stage refers to the twists and turns a baby takes as it is delivered. The head presents facing away from the mother, the shoulders then rotate and the baby is delivered. Stage three is the afterbirth delivery consisting of the now ruptured membrane and the placenta. Stage four is the severance of the cord, a stage that was eliminated in 17th century Europe when men entered the field of midwifery. The traditional midwives in India sever the cord, as I've noted, after the delivery of the placenta. And hospital birth practice follows a European practice, not that of the traditional midwives. Uh, as I said, a natural separation can take up to 10 days. So th there we are, the, the three stages. And uh, number two is a standard practice in India. The, 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 the cord is cut after, after delivery. Now this enables us to understand the ritual cycle of a woman as daughter in India. Lakshmi Jaga defines two stages really of a daughter's life. We might say the fetushood and maidenhood, her life in the womb and her life as a girl. And the birth wedding, the birth ritual and the wedding ritual are the rites of transition. As we've seen, birth is a death of the flower, the placenta, and the beginning of the life of the fruit, the newborn child whose arrival augurs well for the future of humankind because, as women stated, the, she, only the girl has the, pres, the power to reproduce. As we know, basically, 50-50 men, women, there are far too many men. <laughs> we can, just like in horses, we can get rid of a lot of them and still uh, maintain the population. So the, so the, uh, the newborn girl then is a, the classic, the newborn baby girl is the uh, classic form of auspiciousness and the classic form of, uh, of Lakshmi. Now the life cycle of the lotus has provided poets in India with a means of telling the tale in symbolic form and of enacting it in their rituals of birth and marriage. 
When parents go looking for a bride for their son, they greet their parents with a formulaic saying which goes, the scent of a beautiful flower has reached us and we've come to pluck it and take it home. <laughs> so we can see this imagery of the flower is there. The implication of the foregoing is that the uh, person as daughter has two lives. First in her mother's room, secondly as a young girl. The birth ritual symbolically ends the life of a daughter as faith and begins the life of a daughter. As wedding ends her life as a daughter, she becomes the wife of someone else. So a daughter is a relationship then of three quite distinct relationships. In the first, the key one is the mother-daughter relationship, which of course this, the midwife severs. This, then the birth ritual in Buster establishes the unity between the daughter and her father's brotherhood, that abide. And so you go from daughter to mother, daughter to father, and then the wedding ritual, of course, daughter to, sorry, wife to husband. <coughs> so the, um, um, her wedding ritual ends her life as a daughter and begins her life as a, as a uh, as I said, the three quite distinct, I've gone through that. So this belief then requires us to rethink the notion of personhood, a hotly debated issue in Europe and Australia, of course, because of the political consequences of different religious views about the morality of abortion. For some religions, personhood begins at the moment of conception. For others, when the newborn baby has its first birth. And for others, some intermediate period between conception and, and delivery. In Buster, life is, is reckoned to begin at five months into pregnancy when the baby begins to kick. <coughs> um, and, and Babita gave me the following account of conception and birth from a woman's point of view. Having slept with a man and joined with him, the man's water comes and that water which goes into the womb causes you to become pregnant. When the blood of a man and a and woman is mixed, pregnancy occurs. Life comes to the baby after five months. Pain happens after nine months. First of all, the pain begins in the stomach. When the pain begins, the midwife is called. She pours oil on the stomach near the navel. If the oil flows straight down, that means the baby is engaged. After the hot water, water is poured around the stomach and waist. The pain comes from below. When the, when the great pain happens, water falls. Water falls when the four pots break, like a burst balloon. After this, the baby falls. After the baby falls, the flower and the waste falls. After, the, after this, blood falls. The blood stops by itself after seven days. For two to three or six, from two to three months, no sex happens. The father is not allowed to touch the baby until the naming ceremony. The midwife cuts the cord and washes the baby. After this, a hole is dug inside the house. The afterbirth is buried and smeared with cow dung. A fire is burned on top and the buried underbirth hole and the baby is massaged with warm mustard seed oil. The midwife comes twice a day uh, <coughs> to massage the baby. Conception stops the flow of menstrual blood, which according to Guru Mai, accumulates to produce the baby. By this measure, the essence of human life is female blood, which gives us another perspective on the stages of a daughter's life. As a fetus, the daughter is, is being created from the blood, as a, and as a girl, she is in a stage of transition. Her wedding marks her maturity and she begins creating new life-giving blood when she menstruates. Conception enables her to reproduce as a mother. These values present a striking contrast found in the ancient Vedic text. Bestow on me a boy in rest in a lotus so there may be more men, goes a line from the ancient Vedic text. These values, as we see, come not just from male values, but also we'll find the values of wheat eaters are very different to rice eaters. Uh, and we'll look at that in my next lecture. I'd just like to end with a question that I was posed and I couldn't answer when I was in Africa last week, uh, Africa last December, and a Tanzanian man of Indian descent asked me about uh, um, 
uh, we had a question. As a devout Hindu and worshipper of Lakshmi, he'd been long puzzled by the birthday celebrations that we Anglo-Europeans present. Why, he asks, do you celebrate birthdays by blowing out candles on the top of birthday cakes? For us Hindus, light is a sign of life. Our annual Diwali literal is called the Festival of Lights. Every householder lights candles and places them so that Lakshmi can see their way into their houses to bring their wealth, wealth and happiness. Surely a birthday is an auspicious occasion. So why do you use extinguished candles? The question stumped me, of course, and like other people at the table. To be honest, it was never a question that I'd posed before, that is one, I suppose, as an anthropologist, I should have. When I got home, I looked up birthday cake in Wikipedia, and <laughs> don't laugh, the best reference we have. <laughs> and, and I discovered that the origin and significance of birthday cake is unknown. So, as might be expected, in the absence of any specific folklore to explain a ritual, speculative theories are bound to fill the gap. As I ponder this question, now in the light of the preceding discussion, I find myself in a position to advance my own speculative theory. The fact that the people of Buster, like the Padan, light a fire on top of the pit containing the placenta and extinguish it is to mark the symbolic death of a placenta and the birth of a newborn baby got me thinking. For here was ethnographic evidence that contra contradicted his belief that Lakshmi was associated with only with light. He was looking at Lakshmi as a mature woman, here is Lakshmi as a newborn. And so we have Lakshmi as a newborn uh, being associated with the extinguishment and symbolic uh, uh, cremation and burial. <coughs> The court severance rituals at birth are private rituals conducted by the midwife, the mother and other persons only. This evidence requires us to rephrase Narendra's question is, why do some Indians and most Europeans celebrate birthday rituals by extinguishing candles? The latest birth people have some interesting things to say about this. As we have seen, the medicalization of childbirth has seen the disappearance of the fourth stage of labor. The navel cord is cut immediately and the baby is born and the severed placenta becomes medical waste, not a sacred object. Medical waste that's chucked out. The lotus birth advocates are reclaiming the placenta from the waste basket and revaluing it as sacred, and just like the women in Buster do. For those spiritually inclined, this revaluation restores the placenta's sacred value. For those at the more radical end, concerned with natural childbirth, the placenta should be consumed because this is nature's way uh, with animals, including chimps. And the recent scientific evidence uh, reveals that 50% of chimps consume the placenta. Now, <clears throat> it seems that there are some good, sound scientific reasons for eating the placenta among mammals because the placenta is full of vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients, but little evidence that this is beneficial to humans. Whatever the case, the lotus birth advocates argue that humans have replaced the actual consumption of the placenta with the ritualized consumption of it. They note that the placenta is from the Greek, meaning flat cake. The consumption and sharing of the annual birthday cake, then, is a symbolic consumption of the death of the celebrant's placenta. Even in our modern culture, says one person, we enshrine a sense of devotion and celebration to the sacred placenta through these customs. And I found out that two, <laughs> if anyone can tell me where that word comes from, I'll be very happy to know. <laughs> so, and uh, just remind you next week, we move on to food and rice and, uh, and luxury as a young girl. Thank you very much.